name is Priyank Chen. I'm a junior of uh, Yogesh from the Fake Medical School. Uh, I've known Yogesh for a few years now, about six years, but it feels like a lifetime. A uh, special bond with him. Uh, he is a very simple man. Very simple dressing, very simple eating habits, very simple behavior, and uh, born and grew up in Delhi with siblings, with, uh, went to school, went to college, uh, became a doctor, met a girl from Allahabad, has two daughters, the elder one is entering her teens, and Yogesh is graying faster. <laughs> <laughs> but works very hard, gets bogged down by politics, finds comfort in books, finds comfort in family. A very ordinary story, a very ordinary man, sorry, very ordinary person on the face of it. But if you look closely, there's a gem. He is an extraordinary human being with the qualities, with the highest virtues of compassion, con conviction, courage, social justice, sacrifice, and all of these things have made such an inspiring story, which is what we can witness today in the form of Jesus. At the age of 70, probably younger than anybody over here today, when he was probably in his first or second year of medical college is when he came across a book which I think changed, which was a significant uh, incident in his life. The book was about the plight of a young mother in a rural village, who, or in a village, who uh, was uh, struggling through the plight of her dying child. And I think that stirred the compassion, <coughs> it gave a seed of inquiry into the cause of such suffering. And I think over the next undergraduate years and postgraduate years, Yogesh has gone through trying to study and becoming committed to how to relieve suffering. By the time he was my age, he was probably a faculty at the Orange Institute of Medical Sciences. And he realized that the answer to suffering and the understanding to suffering is not where he's looking, it's not in the people who are coming to him with the disease, but in the environment where they're picking up that disease. And so he had to go over there, and he did what was unthinkable to me at this time, and probably crazy, and was being called crazy by most people at that time, where he left his promising career at Ames, and went to a, a, a area in Chhattisgarh along with like-minded doctors, with his wife and his infant child. And then he's built over these last 11 years with the commitment and the sacrifice, uh, an edifice of... Um, uh, a testament to the ethics of uh, compassion and to service. And uh, I think that is, uh, with that, over his, every year there are thousands of people who are benefiting from this and many more who are getting inspired, such as the assembly over here today. Yogesh says that he's, uh, he says that India is not shining, there are two Indias. There is an India which is shining and there is another India which is in the dark, which is hungry, which is cold. And I think Jesus is a beacon of hope in such a place. And for us, prayer is the shining light. That is, the, that is where I see India shining. In India, in Jesus, in English. Please go.
or this question. Is it possible to review this point, what is actually the role of health, of technology in uh, healthcare for the uh, disadvantaged? In fact, the disadvantaged lost their A also in this. But, uh, 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 but this is, I want to explore this question with uh, over the next 40 minutes. And for this, I'm going to only use I'm only going to use the experience of the organization with which I work, of which I'm only one of the many, many people, to understand this question further. Uh, I'm going to discuss about the context of the work that we do. I'm going to discuss the strategy that we've been using in our work, how we have used it in the healthcare programs, and in the uh, the force multiplication of, the, of whatever we have done for uh, healthcare of the disadvantaged elsewhere. And specifically, I like, because this is MIT, uh, to discuss about uh, what I would call as research technology. <coughs> uh, we cry from the rooftop that if illnesses are due to deprivation, then physicians become the natural attorney of the poor. And since, you know, over time we have imperceptibly, you know, moved into the social space and are not mere healthcare providers. Uh, some of the questions that come up, uh, I'd like to explore. Wilco said this 150 years ago and it's not, uh, it, it is uh, not uh, any less true now. This is the team of only the physicians and some of the senior physicians. It is not the entire, all the, all the physicians who are there and who sometimes help us uh, uh, from far, but also the uh, the other 150 odd staff members. Just to even tell, it might, I'll take one minute to say, uh, there are two physicians, Ravi and Ramani from CMC, who were trained at CMC, Christian Medical College, Bilo. Uh, um, this is Madhuri, uh, Madhuri, Anurag, Anurag, uh, the heart of the organization in a way, Atul, oh, sorry, Anju, this is Raman Kadari, who is a surgeon. And this is Rashna, my wife. Uh, people, Janswas Seo, for those who don't know Hindi, uh, is the People's Health Support Group. And actually, uh, what probably uh, is something characteristic of this is that it is not a one person's organization. There is no daddy or, uh, of this organization. It's actually a process in which there is an organization working together. We chose to work in Central India, in this uh, state which is. Uh, Next to which is carved out in Madhya Pradesh, and chose a place which is uh, a little uh, 20 kilometers north of Bilaspur town to able to uh, to set up a community health program in an area which is characterized by at least some of these things. One of them is hunger. People like to call it malnutrition or uh, undernutrition. Let's call it hunger, but because it is that is what it actually is. It's a sanitized, uh, malnutrition is a sanitized word for uh, hunger. If you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, the body mass index, 18.4 is the BMI of the women in this area. I'm talking about not patients, I'm talking about people in the world. 18, and the, the WHO wants, says, the daddy of health in the, in the world, that 18.5 is a cutoff for the, uh, for the BMI. Uh, as a cutoff for the undernutrition, for hunger. And that means at least 50% of women have weights less than 18.5 uh, uh, and are undernourished. And the same, the, the cutoff for men is 19.1. This is certainly a hungry, hungry community. And WHO says that a society that has more than 40% people whose BMIs are lower than what, what should be is a, is a society in crisis. Uh, and an emergency situation. The heights also, the average heights are 150, 151 uh, centimeters for women and 160 centimeters for uh, men. If you look at weights, these, these weights are 41 kilos, the, the median weights are 41 kilos among women and 50 kilos for uh, men. But this is not only just the, you know, this is a mere average median weight. If you look at the, uh, the primitive tribes, there are, there are some in our area, 
and then the regular tribes, the, uh, the more mainstream uh, uh, tribes, and you go towards Dalits, backward castes, and the, the, the non, uh, uh, the, the others, you can see a clear, you can see a clear uh, gradient. The weights, the BMIs, are, uh, the BM, are, there is a gradient. Some people are doing clearly poorer than the others. Much as we, uh, we say that caste should not be included, caste is actually a good marker of the nutrition, of the economic and the social status of the people. The second characteristic of the area that we, that we try to work in is access. Yogesh, I need to interrupt for one second. The live stream is not working, uh, so we need to give you this one. of this area is the access problem. This is the usual terrain that people have to uh, walk across to be able to reach uh, and often uh, vehicles require the animal path to uh, move across the uh, flooded rivers. And this is a picture, this is, uh, this is what is the, uh, what, what picture that captures the, uh, the, the rural crisis. Transportation is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue. Most of you, uh, those who have seen the movie Three Idiots, it has been glamorized in a way to, to suggest that this is how it could be done. But people who are unconscious or who are uh, who are too sick to be able to sit up have forced to be sandwiched between two healthy adults to be able to, to and they are taken to the because four wheel vehicles are not available in rural areas in most of the uh, places and very very sick people are often brought uh, a sandwich uh, ambulance. So, this is actually the front line, and we believe strongly that we, most people and most poor people still live in rural India. There is a problem in urban area, but this is the, this is the first fact. And the burden of these diseases and are disproportionately higher among the poor, and therefore among the in, in rural areas. <laughs> And the third thing is that, you know, therefore the battles among the, for uh, battles against the illnesses will be won or lost in rural India, nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And in this area, the problem is that all the foot soldiers, are, you know, they are absent, they are ill-equipped, uh, communication systems are poor, and therefore the, the, where the need is the highest, uh, you, all your support services are the lowest. So in this, such a context, we, uh, we have been able to develop a program a community health program in an agroforestry economy situation where people from about 1500 villages from which come from about 8 districts 4 of Chhattisgarh and 4 of Madhya Pradesh access for their major health needs the second level of our health care is to be we run the <coughs> centers where people which are based which are close to the which are in the forest villages where people from 50 villages around access it for their primary care these are also manned by uh, by by uh, senior level health workers, like <coughs> Sarai is paying later. And for about 53 villages, we have an intensive database of their nutrition, economic status, demographic, and their health status, where we try to uh, understand the problems a little better. Uh, we, so we run a, a referral center, this is one of the pictures of the OPD, a ward. We provide drugs, generic drugs, uh, with, with pictorial uh, slips. <coughs> Take the lab to the people, a lab which will include a, a microscope, a coloring meter, and a centrifuge, enough to uh, provide healthcare in a way, uh, the laboratory services. If necessary, and as, as it has been in the past, we have been doing tuberculosis culture because resistance to bacteria, uh, and resistance in, anti, in, uh, in, TB, in TB bugs is common, and we were trying to study this also. Provide, providing surgical services, doing, developing appropriate technology, which I will come. And uh, a village health worker based program are the other components of this uh, community health program. For those of us who are physicians uh, specifically, but for all others who are interested in healthcare, 
any single day in the in the in the community health program of Jan Swasthya Sehyo, uh, there is a bewildering spectrum of patients. So there are usual emergencies: a woman with obstructed labor, a patient with extensive tuberculosis who requires uh, uh, oxygen and other supporting services, a, a, a man with biomyositis, a woman with burns due to epilepsy, a newborn with tracheoesophageal fistula, a, a life-threatening problem, and then there are so many routine cases. One woman with advanced cancer of the cervix, 12 patients on follow up for a disease that, that is actually the heart disease of the poor, the rheumatic heart disease, 10 patients with sickle cell anemia on a single day, 2 patients with polyarthritis, one of which is a, a, a zero negative spondylarthropathy. And then problems below 3 new patients with tuberculosis, one of which has failed due to the, uh, the gene that is prescribed in the state, to a patient with multifacillary leprosy. Two new patients with hypertension, one with a blood pressure of 230 by 140 without knowing it, and a 30 year old man with low body weight type 2 diabetes. And the other problems like uh, a patient with a feature suggestible cervical cord compression, some spinal cord compression, a patient with a suspected baby dog bite. This is only an example. Obviously, mental health problems and others are also there. A child, uh, one young man with tuberculosis who required oxygen for six weeks. A family of three, the father, son and the daughter, all having tuberculosis at the same time. A child with sickle cell disease and dactylitis. A woman who has developed a, a fistula connecting her uh, urethra along with, to the, her vagina mm -hmm. and she is continuously leaking urine. Uh, a person with leprosy and a nerve abscess. Burns, uh, burns, a post burns contracture because her sister who had epilepsy was not treated and, and she had a seizure and this kid which was being held by her sister, fell into the fire. A newborn uh, with intestinal obstruction, a bad infection, a child, a woman with uh, obstructed labor and a hand prolapse. A woman who is 34 years old has a, has a rheumatic heart disease with a, with a bad mitral stenosis, uh, almost homebound. A young man with diabetes. Almost 85% of our diabetes, diabetes patients have low body weight. They are not obese. Even with gastroschisis, three children at the same time having pus in their, uh, in their, in their, uh, in their chest. But the biggest problem, if you can see, is that they are both, all three are hungry. Mm. People in small places do not have small problems. This is uh, very clear. This was a myth that was exploded. I remember my mother when uh, when I was leaving for Bilaspur used to say, "Tu What will you do there? We will be just treating you coughs and colds." And I used to then feel that maybe I was being a little, you know, I was trying to pay the social debt and I felt that, that uh, maybe, uh, okay, I'll, you know, I'll live with the fact that I'm not, I'm not so much, uh, I'm not so much being, I would not be professionally so satisfied. But I, I think we all, who have, all of us who have worked there, feel so technically challenged in fact. I think as a, our, profession, our professional abilities are far more asked into, uh, into uh, pressed into service when they were there, when we were uh, at Ames or other institutions where we took our training. And the burden of illness is if you even count the numbers at a clinic, and this clinic catering are, are huge numbers. 515 new patients with tuberculosis. I was telling Satish a little while ago, I remember an OPD about two months ago, where I, had, I saw 15 new patients for sputum positive tuberculosis on a single OPD, mm. in an OPD of about 250 to 300. Let us see, 180 new patients in a year, hypertension, 400 new patients. These are, these are large numbers for any clinic. Rheumatic heart disease, 75 new patients in a, in a, in a year in 2009. Cancers, 300 new cancers of which 220 were are among women. Hypertension also, interestingly, in our area it is a problem among the women. Uh, Two thirds of the hypertension are among uh, adult women, none of them overweight. And if you look at even the community data, these prevalences are high. Quite high by any standards. The first thing is that actually the burden of illnesses among the poor is, is not known. And so this is the only preliminary data that we seem to be you know, sort of stumbled upon. And the, the uh, other colleagues, probably, there is no other data that we can even compare our prevalences with. So overall, there are massive levels of hunger. There are massive levels of morbidity in these areas. There are high numbers of premature deaths. 
these problems have been known, have been always marginalized. But the problem that has happened recently over the last uh, five or six <coughs> years is that they are getting increasingly trivialized. Mm -hmm. Give them a health worker, problem will be solved. We, we all have been saying that there should be a village health worker at each village health. But we never said that only we should have a village health worker. We, should, we need doctors. We need a health service to be able to provide uh, for the problems which are not small. And, these are, and, and, it's, and this is an increasing trivialization of poor people's problems because the people who decide are not actually poor. And this is this other thing. I will mention those BMI which don't make sense. These are all people who are undernourished. These are all people who require health care for a particular time, who, who, who are at risk of getting illnesses. A woman of 40, sorry, a woman of uh, 41 kilos who came with, uh, uh, with, uh, with anxiety, a 46 kilo man who came for uh, some foot infection, a woman who's 33 kilos came for a pregnancy, a girl who's 11 kilos uh, at four and a half years, all at risk in a way because of the hunger that they are uh, they're living with. The other problems are there in rural life at this moment and we, we need to look. There is a problem of livelihood. Even though <coughs> the rural employment guarantee scheme is there, people in rural villages don't have work. It's, and I don't believe that people don't want to work. If everyone wants to work. And the only, only, only property in a way poor people have is their ability to labor. And when you don't get work, as Schumacher once said, it, it, is, the, it is the biggest uh, hurt that you can have to your, your insight. When you, are, when, you want to, when you want work and you're not able to get work. Rural credit. In Delhi, you can get a car at almost 0% interest. A ma ma Maruti uh, on loan. But if you want 1,000 rupees, if your kid is sick with pneumonia, in a rural area, you cannot get this money. Unless it's you pawn off your gold or your silver. The Indian banks do not take any other things. They don't take even your utensils. So the biggest money lenders at the moment are the school teachers because they have money, cash money. And in a cash strapped economy, they are the only money lenders at this moment in the Indian villages. The, and the support systems are coming down. Public distribution system. We had a, when I was a kid, we had a ration system. We used to get food. All of us used to get rations. Ration, we used to use ration cards in Delhi or in other places. Now it is only targeted to the officially poor. And, and there is this BPL. As if, you know, those who are not BPL, below poverty line, are disenfranchised citizens. They are not citizens anymore of the, of the, of the people, or of the country. So only if you have hold a card, then you are a citizen. So if, if, I am not, if I don't hold a poverty line card, which is given only to 26% in the country, then you cannot access healthcare free. Healthcare, education, irrigation, everything is suffering. <coughs> migration, therefore, is common because there is no work to, to cities and life as a migrant, it may be, it may be, you may be able, it, says it, it offers a survival advantage, but it offers, but it makes your life very difficult. Rural transportation has been disbanded in most of the country because it is not cost effective. When the, in the effectiveness, they did not count that your ability to reach a hospital was not counted, to, to be able to get education was not counted. What was counted was how much money went into fuel and salaries and how much was collected as a measure of... Uh, so rural transportation, there are no public transport systems in, in the central Indian states that I know of. And because of this, I think somebody did do a study of the number of deaths that may have happened among people. Mm. Cash crunch is there and medical poverty is a new thing. People becoming actually poor because of accessing healthcare which is unregulated. In such a situation, actually this is, this is happening. The, the village is dying. There is poverty of income, of distance, as I've mentioned, but also of the spirit. Uh, someone doesn't feel proud of being a village. And we, we feel in this, the, as a marker before I come to the rest of technology, primary health care is, for us, not primary level care only. Primary health care is health care for all the common and important problems that people suffer from. And it is, it is not a second rate medicine for the have -nots. It is not that I give my child amoxicillin if my child gets pneumonia and your child gets cotamoxicillin. It is not that I, when I get leprosy, I take daily the as, I, as anyone in leprosy, as anyone who gets leprosy in the US gets. But for a developing country, you give them once a month leprosy. This is not, this is not public health. This is not, this is immoral medicine. And, these are, and for us, primary health care is not straight jacketed, privileged protocols that the poor should have. Uh, while the rich can have individualized care. 
their care has to be of the same level for the for irrespective of economic status. So, if this level in this context, we have been trying to, our strategy in our work has been to provide service uh, uh, which is which is tiered at a tiered level. There is a referral center, there are sub centers, and also by uh, healthcare by the village health workers who have been chosen by the community and trained by us and supported by the community. At the same time, our strategy has been a problem based learning. Since none of us were, you know, in a sense, public health experts, we went into the arena of uh, the social arena and have been learning over time, looking at a problem and then trying to solve it. For example, we realized that our village health workers were using medicines that were that they were uh, trained to use for uh, human illnesses for their animals who became sick. So that why don't we get into them um, using? Uh, uh, training village health workers for animal health care also. So there is a separate cadre of you know animal women animal health workers also. Or we got into you know we started running a bus in our community health program because we realized that public transport is a huge issue. And you, if people the only image of a public transport is uh, a public transport for health is an ambulance, which is only when you are supine that you that you, you and it's expensive at that particular moment. So when people are still not so sick and can still travel by uh, road, why don't we have a bus that runs for health? So we call it a public swast vahan. So we call it public transport for health. The third uh, strategy has been that we have been trying to use force multiplier. We work in a certain area of which caters about 1500 villages, small number in, in a large country. So what have we learned from what we have done? We like to share it either through training, and training I think is a very, very powerful way of, of uh, building up uh, your morale, your, your, or your direction of work, but also through some amount of research and through advocacy. Advocacy with whoever decides the policy or the practice. And here I would like to now uh, uh, place this context to the, the role of technology. Technology is actually the <coughs> applied science, if one may say. So there are some knowledge skills. I think using those skills in a way is, is a very path, is a, is, a, is a potent way of uh, de decreasing inequity. All what we do is actually in healthcare, when you say physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor, or health workers are the natural attorneys of the poor, is to use, somehow de reduce inequity in some way, whatever you are doing, either through your knowledge or the technical skill that you can share. And thirdly, by you know, uh, since the rare technology, technology is some of these instruments and equipment is something also we've been involved in trying to make, and some public health techniques that are discussing. First, so therefore, uh, one of our first uh, technological inputs has been providing low cost and yet high quality healthcare. How did we try that? Through some systems modifications, for one. Reducing the cost of diagnosis. And third was obviously to reducing the cost of drugs. How did we do in the system? We, the, the, uh, the, the technology that we used was despecialized. We, many of us were specialists uh, in various uh, clinical subspecialties or super specialties as used often. But while these are necessary, one doesn't have to be a prisoner of one's own speciality, which often happens. Uh, I, I can hear of neurologists say, oh, I, I cannot manage uh, hypertension or I, I cannot look after an angina because, you know, I'm now, I'm a specialized neurologist. My, much as he or she would have gone through MD medicine uh, before they, they went. I mean, this is a problem we all have faced, but so uh, despecialization so that, you know, you're not paralyzed by your own speciality. Specialization is something that we did in our system. The second thing that I think was important was that we said same day treatment. People often trundle down for what, a day or two to be able to seek health care. And if you tell them, oh, I buy you certain investigation, then you come the next day, no, that doesn't work out. And getting the medicine. So we said, even if it stretches the system, we have to have single day uh, service provision from the consultation to investigations to treatment, taking back home and counseling, whatever it has to be done. <coughs> of course, I said, if you, if you, unless you require an elective surgery, you're given days. As an example, using glass syringes. We have found in our work that glass syringe, using glass syringes in this world of disposable uh, uh, I saw yesterday a coffee uh, pot which was made of paper uh, uh, and, uh, uh, 
So, uh, using glass syringes in a in a place where uh, uh, where in a uh, where uh, we found that it is cheaper, more reliable, more easy to use than disposable plastic syringes, and obviously more environmentally friendly. So, we use uh, we use glass syringes in our in our service. Uh, as a, even as a you know as a as a challenge to to the health system that why don't we use it to reduce the uh, We ask this question to ourselves in trying to reduce the cost of healthcare and also to make healthcare available. Can a good lab system continue the cost of healthcare? Well, if the patient cannot come to the lab, the lab can go to the patient. It's like you know mom. And can go to the mountain, but the mountain can go to Muhammad, and I'll show you an example of that. I think the lab is critical in primary healthcare. It has been something that you know all our pundits of primary healthcare have constantly, you know, sort of uh, belittled. And the fact that antibiotics were so cheap, microbiology was never considered important by by most physicians. Give penicillin from one milligram to ten grams. No, you, there's no harm. You know, maximum you get a small rash. Or some, some, so there is this, uh, the safety of the antibiotic itself became the enemy of the antibiotics and therefore labs were never uh, you know, respected that. So we, uh, are we feel that it's a very cut down cost. We have done studies to show and it done, uh, you use the lab properly, it reduces cost of healthcare rather than increasing it. And surgery goes to develop appropriate health related technology. So the lab goes like this, as I said, showed in the picture before. Uh, and. Uh, so one specific question about this lab going to the people. Now this question is important of anyone who's who has seen the problems of healthcare in rural India. Is it possible for a person who's staying in an off the road village, where buses don't go, to get a report for a blood smear, which is the investigation of uh, necessary for diagnosing malaria among fever people who have developed fever. At, at this moment, the only, the, the minimum time that it takes in the public health system to get a report for on a blood smear which has been done to prove whether malaria is there or not is minimum of 15 days. And, and no, I mean no person in, sen in his senses or her senses can believe that that is, an, that is a, a right amount of time. Malaria can kill in 3 days. It can kill in 2 days. It can kill in a day also. You need a report in time for the person to feel confident about what they are treating and also to know and also to modify the treatment if necessary. So we, 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 were, we were grappling with this question, as I said, a problem based learning that we had. So we, we trained our village health workers to make blood smears. But because there was no laboratory close to them, we said, why don't we, uh, why, not, why don't we get the lab to the people who somehow so this is a picture of one of our village health workers who's going to a family uh, where someone is there of fever. She examines him. Uh, there is a there is a kit that she has uh, where she uh, makes blood smears, and these smears are then dried, then wrapped in pictorial forms because most of these people are new literate. These children who go to an off the on the road village because school high schools are uh, only in big big villages. And these, then these uh, boxes of slides are collected by uh, buses that go from rural area to urban area. And uh, from various villages they would collect from all the off the road villages. And these are then, uh, they, when they cross our referral center at Ganyari, they are picked up by someone, stained on priority, reported in time in two hours, for them to be uh, going back with some instructions back by these buses that go back to the rural areas in the afternoon in good time for these children to take back to their villages when they go home in the evening for the health worker to be able to decide what is the correct treatment should they be referred should they be considered for some other treatment and thus we could use this technology of the lab and over every year we, we report about 3500 slides um, on patients um, I think we must have saved some lives certainly the, the other question is that, you know, we, we found that technology is so expensive, the healthcare is expensive for one specific reason, which is that health-related that health technology is very expensive. And uh, if you let something to an industry, like you have left the drug industry, uh, uh, you have drugs to the industry, 
uh, profit motives come in, and people who, uh, because people who are disadvantaged are the ones who fall sick more frequently, this is counterintuitive that you have uh, people who, are, who require healthcare more are the ones who are the least able to pay. So therefore, it, is, it, was, it became a politically correct decision to develop a low-cost health-related technology if we were able to do. So this could be, as I said, skills, aids, techniques and ideas. So we looked at now public health questions and we started developing technology. One of which, so for an example, I am saying, how do I know that the water that I am drinking or that we are drinking is potable? This is a question important in uh, in uh, in uh, in India. Uh, we drink water like this with, with, the, with the belief, with the trust that this is safe. But how do we know that the water that we are drinking is safe? <coughs> is there a technique that a, that a person can use on his or her own to be sure? So we developed these small culture bottles that could be incubated against body's temperature. And we added a color indicator to pick up certain bacteria. Like H2S is produced by certain uh, Clostridia and uh, fecal streptococci, which sort of go along with the uh, coliforms you know, that, that are known to cause uh, gastroenteritis. So uh, here, you know, these pictures uh, of, you know, these culture bottles are filled with water, uh, and these are pre-sterilized. If the water is uh, fecally contaminated, they turn as black as that, jet black. If the water is is uh, not contaminated with fecal matter, if they remain as, uh, mild yellow um, because of the, uh, the the food the, for the bacteria that there is in. And if that is the case, then you can disinfect the water because you need to disinfect the water. So we said these ultraviolet lamps that are available or the reverse osmosis that are available are not so easy to get. So we developed this, this technique in which there is a steel drum which has a UV drum, UV ultraviolet lamp on the under surface of the leg which can even be operated by a cycle dynamo. It doesn't require too much power, 15 minutes is what is necessary. Mm. This water is purified and this can be made available. Uh, in many people in Chhattisgarh are using this now for uh, their thing and there, we have a pending model of 35,000 drums. We certainly are not an industry but this is the, uh, this is the level of which technology will take. Developing technologies for the village of Loka. A micro, a small thermometer. Thermometers are difficult to read. You know, I, I remember as a child squinting my eyes to understand the mercury. For people who have low levels of literacy, it is even more difficult. So we use, we said, why do, why do we need to know exactly the temperature? You know, you can divide the, the thermometry into so-called low temperatures, which are also worried, worrisome in, in uh, certain age groups, particularly newborns, or normal temperature. And then do, that is uh, that is and what is called fever, and this can be taught more. So we a pictorial, a simple, easy to read thermometer, which should be there, a flat one is something that we developed by color coding, a uh, easy to read uh, BP instrument. But even even uh, things like electrophoresis apparatus, most the cheapest electrophoresis apparatus that are available in in central India is a minimum of sixty thousand rupees, mm. with a running cost of two hundred rupees per test. So we developed this electrophoresis apparatus, which has been tested over eight years, which cost three thousand rupees, and uh, the running cost is eighteen rupees on, uh, for a for a single test. Mm. Or at the community level, these are needs. No, uh, you need a first aid kit, which is much more than just a band aid and uh, you know a few uh, cotton thrown in. Or a, uh, we need a you need you need a splints for fractures. You need uh, 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 you know for a triangular splint, you require. Uh, you require uh, this thing. You require safety pins. You require snake bite management, uh, tunicase, uh, whatever. And our delivery kit that looks at the needs of the baby, child, and the mother, uh, the baby, mother, and the midwife uh, is also that has been developed. And similarly, things like a breath counter for diagnosing pneumonia and as and an infantometer are among the many things that we have tried to develop. The third technology that is necessary in terms of knowledge and attitude would be to the use of the pharmacy. I'd like to go over it fast to say that, you know, actually drug costs are important and, you know, you really need to get the general view because the people who pay for drugs are not the ones who decide. And the ones who decide do not need to, don't have to pay. So you have to somehow intervene in some way. The system has to intervene to get the cheapest drugs of high quality to people to be able to make healthcare low cost. So we do this in our, in our system, a pharmacy, we procure and prescribe on basis of generics and do a standard procurement, make pictorial forms for people's things. And the differences are, are, are amazing. Albendazole is 1 to 50 paise at I don't know, our clinics. 
where in the market it is tied to 12 rupees. And similarly for other drugs. Mm. And these are almost a rip-off prices. I'm no in the US it is it's far, far, far worse. But uh, but this is this is still bad enough in uh, in, in India. The third is obviously, to, you know, we try to do technologies, uh, human technology. So, uh, this is a pediatrician colleague of mine, Anju, who is now trained as an anesthetist while working, uh, uh, while getting trained on the job. Using a mosquito bed net, uh, bed net uh, as, a, uh, as a mesh uh, repair for hernia. Uh, uh, this works. We have more than 1,000 hernias being repaired uh, with this. One of the other technologies that we have said is a good, well-trained health worker. Chosen well, but trained well, and then monitor, then then supported. So we have we have uh, village health workers who are all chosen by the uh, village community. Literacy is not a criteria because literacy is class related, and we, therefore we decided that we will not. Uh, 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 we can we, we might uh, this might make the pedagogy more difficult, but we want village health workers who need to go to each house. So therefore we said okay. We will, uh, because uh, literacy, we wanted people who are representative of the population. So village health workers have been trained now to do blood pressure checks. And this is the teaching stethoscope, one of the other technologies that was developed with two chest, with two ear piece, set of ear pieces and one uh, chest piece. Both as, you know, training device and also as an inspection device, examination device. The other thing is, you know, we identified problems like, you know, the food needs of the under three are actually not looked after by any scheme, and therefore uh, uh, developing uh, uh, nutrition programs for the under three child is one of the specific technological uh, knowledge inputs that we develop and put into practice. Kids, uh, the, the biggest reason why children in the developing world are, uh, at least in India, are, are undernourished or hungry is because they do not get adequate complementary feeding because parents have to go out for work. There is no other reason. It's not knowledge. It is not only income. It is actually the fact that food doesn't go into its gullets. And you have to make food go down the gullets of children who are between 6 months and 3 years. The Anganwadi program, the ICDS program in India actually looks only after children who are above 3 years. For other children, they give take home rations which, doesn't, which is distributed among children. Uh, among the entire family. So, we need to have a program that looks at the needs of the rural under three kids. And therefore, this program that we have uh, been running uh, with support from uh, many friends in, uh, in this country. This is a bus that I was mentioning about. So, uh, you know, kids are brought. Uh, the, this is the bus that operates from the farthest village in our program to Ganyari every day. Takes, gets, gets in people with illnesses. Well, after the treatment, the, the bus goes back and is parked in the last village so that if there is any emergency at night, then it can also still ferry as the classic, as the traditional ambulance, but during the day it runs with the bus. Okay. Advocacy is a tough thing, actually, because healthcare is so deeply political. You know? Why are people poor? Is, uh, why, why are people unhealthy? Because they are poor, mainly. So to, when you want to reduce poverty, it's actually a political work. But you should try it. Advocacy is so-called a weak man's, uh, a person's weak attempt to make an issue political. But we need to do it first through service and then by lobbying for, uh, with the powers that are. And I feel in this so-called, uh, in our force multiplication, one of the biggest things that you can do is supporting communities through technical skills and knowledge skills. And uh, I, I want to run that, uh, sorry, uh, there's a video clip. I want to show you, this is a person, uh, a 40 year old was, a man who was brought by his wife for behoshi, for being unconscious. And I want you to diagnose this illness. Uh, those who have seen this clip before as friends may not say that, and, but anyone else who would like to say so-called diagnose. And I know there are many people among us who are physicians and many who are otherwise, uh, uh, I'm not in the same uh, No, this one. There is a separate thing, the same folder. Um, yeah, this one. It is running in the VLC meeting.
there is no answer because the, uh, the, there may be some data from the clinics for certain illnesses the data may be there in the community but for, for uh, as the general thing what is the burden of illnesses as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, not, as a not so stupid uh, graduate of medicine in 1999 I believed that problems in rural India were not major they were mainly coughs, colds and diarrhea but this, this, and, this, and then when, when one sees this this question becomes so important that there is, there is I, I realize that hypertension occurs among women there is, uh, there, is, there, is, there is this huge level of leprosy which is still continuing. The, the, these are, this is the job of I think an observational research person to find out and I think that is uh, using technology of, you know, of questioning and trying to find answers is probably one of the most potent things that you can do for uh, reducing the inequity now. What is the healthcare package that should be there at each level of health facility? Why is the refrigerator not there at our CHC level? Why? I, I cannot understand. Why are there hospitals <coughs> in cities and not in, uh, in villages? Why are only health centers there in rural area? This is a question that needs, that needs to be answered. As if people in cities do not require preventive care and people in rural India don't require curative care. Is that the assumption? Just the asking the right questions becomes so critical. Why don't we have price control over essential drugs? Because is this, a, is this irrelevant because this is a political question? No, I think this is the, in, in technology uh, research, the first thing is to ask the right question and that, that we have failed in that regard. I learned as a, uh, as a, as a in person interested in infectious diseases that malaria in central India is a disease of in winters, November, December and January. We have uh, data from at least uh, seven years which shows that the peak of malaria happens in November. 2010 uh, winters we lost 500 people in our district due to malaria because and the, and, and the program in, in, in India, central India, the program in India uh, has the malaria control uh, so called uh, fortnight celebrated in June of the year which where the, if you can make out, the incidence is almost the lowest in all the years except one. Observational research has a, has a role in reducing inequity. And the second point is, I, I, this is an exploration with, with fellow travelers. What, what about the design of the <coughs> studies, of research studies that should be done in rural areas for the poor? Should they be the same benchmarks that we do for labs or we, what, that we will do in a, in a, in a clinic? I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that there should, be, should, there should be a compromise on the quality on the, on the basic method of science. But I think there is a need to look at this. People are not a human laboratory. And there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a, there is a genuine problem. And I can quote from the experience of, of, of two friends, Abhay Bang and Vinayak Sen. My friend Vinayak Sen is a, is a top rate pediatric uh, pediatrician who is at the moment in jail uh, because he has been accused of sedition and he is, but he always used to find this hugely problematic to do research among people because he said there, is an, there was a major ethical dilemma in trying to look at answers, look at questions like this food in tuberculosis. Should we give food to some people and now in, in 2011 and prove that tuberculosis uh, requires food for better, improve, better survival? He had major problems. At another level, uh, we have another serious friend equally committed to poor people like Abhay Bang who tries to address these questions. Uh, with methods which also include a control group and this is, I think that this is a dynamic thing and I think the research community among us have to really grapple with this question to come to a good answer. We, we feel very challenged in deciding the right type of design for getting the answers. Some people have proposed that this thing over action based research, while you are doing service you try to find an answer. We did one of this thing like trying to find out whether chloroquine as a major drug in malaria works or not. Trying to find out this, whether the this sensitivity to this drug is there or not among the malaria, falciper malaria. We've been able to do this, but we are not completely satisfied with the, with the method that we have. Probably it requires rigor, which is very, uh, why probably? It, it does require rigor, but whether it is possible to evolve criteria, methods to do, Answering of these questions uh, when we are working with in, a, in the community is uh, still, uh, I think, a need. Finally, I would like to say, yeah, I will take this question. 
So uh, I, I like I welcome again to this point. Healthcare in rural India actually is the opportunity to be at the front line. It definitely widens horizons. I, I have I have learned more than I have given uh, to be in, in the world. You really acquire skills, both medical and uh, social. And I think finally, it really fights the uh, cynicism and hopelessness that can proceed fast to apathy. Mm. I have been quoting this that there are three types of doctors, and this is uh, uh, who are good doctors. Three types of good doctors. There are bad doctors, they are separate. <laughs> <laughs> Type 1 good doctor is who diagnoses well on basis of his or her knowledge, heals bodies and minds. And in as much that is the society is a, is a summation of individuals, they are providing public health. It's important, the way they counsel, the way they, the way they decide if, uh, if uh, Dr. Joshi is a good uh, ID specialist, the, what she prescribes is seen by 100 people. Uh, that she has prescribed this medicine for this illness, and many people learn from it. This is uh, uh, this is a good type one doctor. Uh, many we have many friends. We are some of us are like that. The type two doctor, good doctor, is the classic public health doctor. They look at the determinants of illness, but usually the proximate determinants of illness. Illness is like whether when, when diarrhea is happening in the community, they find out whether it's the water that has got contaminated. Whether the illnesses, uh, certain nutritional illnesses are there, whether the food is uh, is a problem, whether the uh, if, and similarly whether you know if someone is uh, in a in a cement factory develops uh, a respiratory problem, whether silico silicosis has happened. These are the typical public health doctors, and most schools of public health are actually churning out good type two doctors. So the type three doctor is one. Public health doctor is one who is looking at the most basic determinants, displacement, the fact which medical school teaches that in India, the amount of money that is invested into into public health into rural areas has gone down from eight to nine percent to 0.5 percent, and that in army the, the 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 for defense the budgets have increased for counter terrorism they have increased. So uh, who questions? What is it? What is it? The sequestration of funds that is happening in India of land and money, which is that not a job of a doctor? I think it is a job of a, a time three doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Agish. Uh, we have time for a few questions, but. Uh, Two things, uh, please raise your hand and I will come in order. At the same time, because it's being live casted, uh, the question will have to be paraphrased, which I will attempt to do, and in case I cannot, I will ask Yogesh to paraphrase the question before he answers. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. Yes. I've heard. Uh, very similar presentations to this uh, from doctors in Cuba, and uh, they have a whole uh, array of uh, program of special medical school and placement doctors around the world. I was wondering if there's any cooperation between you and that of those efforts. So the question was that there have been similar efforts in Cuba, and uh, whether JSS and Yogesh have any collaboration, intellectual or uh, in terms of work, with these doctors. No, not as yet, uh, but I think the basic tools are the same everywhere, and uh, uh, we, to, we are learning the same things uh, uh, as friends in Cuba may have done. Uh, also, please identify yourself, and, you know, just to explain it uh, back there. Yes. Yep. I was just wondering, so when you were making services available for people who perhaps did not receive these services before, was there any lack of trust towards Western medicine? Did you have to deal with any of those challenges? In paraphrase, uh, whether people had had in our work uh, any mistrust or any doubts about uh, Western medicine, uh, the answer is no. 
I, I think um, people always try to judge, and they should, we also, we all of us judge any new intervention, any new interaction, and I and I have people accept what is useful for them. We haven't seen this problem about uh, this super belief in faith healing or belief in uh, some other things that are considered. That why don't people you know take rational decisions? I think the reason why most people have gone for um, for say Jhola uh, Chhap doctor or informal practitioners or for other systems of medicine are primarily have been primarily economic financial. Most Western medicine has been actually very expensive. People have been from either from different classes or uh, different uh, uh, social milieu, and trust building is maximum with areas that you uh, with your own with your own uh, own types. And I think hospitals have been. Uh, um, we have often wondered why don't people go to hospitals when you prescribe them, when you refer them from hospital. The major reason is money. If you can ensure that you know you would be able to uh, prevent impoverishment, because once you're in a hospital, you are completely out of it's out of your control. You're not making decisions. And I uh, we have realized that people want uh, 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 people value their opinion if it is helps them and if it is not. Uh, damaging their social, uh, damaging them socially. At the same time, we have realized like uh, injection use for illnesses in area that we work are almost 100% in the community. Almost everyone gets a shot uh, for any illness. At uh, our own health services, it is less than 3% of our, all illnesses combined. And people come uh, because they feel that it, it helps them. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Sanjeev. I work here at MIT. Um, so um, your talk was very informative. I just had a question regarding the fact that you were saying that poor in India also have a lot of complications, like as far as diseases go. But uh, like, which was contrary to my belief, I, in the sense that I thought that mostly people die from very preventable diseases. So I just wondered, like, for example, over the years that you have seen all the deaths uh, taking place among these people, how what percentage do you think are from illnesses which are just curable in the sense that if there was a rich person and would have got that illness, he could have been cured given the right proper treatment at the right time? 60%. 60% in a study that we did in 2005. 60% of deaths are preventable deaths. Obviously all death, not, death is not preventable finally, but um, you can postpone it. And 60% uh, of the uh, deaths were due to illnesses that for that particular time would have been would have been averted. And I have one more question, sorry. Uh, like, for example, regarding communication in the sense that if somebody uh, has uh, uh, has an illness, like how quickly they can actually uh, get back to the doctors? Like, what's, like, is it just the ambulance that you uh, have? Or like, do you have some kind of a phone? Yeah. Uh, like, I think sometimes that's uh, like a real major issue. Yeah, I, I didn't look at all, I didn't, uh, I was only using examples for certain technologies. We have been trying to now recently use the cell phone technology. In fact, telemedicine is not what we need. We need telemedicine. Um, uh, and, um, it is uh, communication by uh, by by speech and uh, even pictures is uh, very very useful. And um, you know, we all all we all give advice to people on telephone, not only uh, from across the uh, across the continents and. This is um, this is very useful. Uh, village health workers and the community communicating with, uh, with uh, well more informed uh, uh, partners uh, is something that we're doing. And uh, one of the uh, Association for India's development chapters, eight uh, Bay Area, is supporting us with a telemedicine medicine program that we do. So we have uh, all our village health workers now have cell phones, even though there is no network in most places. So they have to go to the place to you know. Where they can get a network or sometimes climb a hill or a tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, can you just raise your hand so that let me establish an order. So I have Gaurav, I have that lady, I have uh, yeah. this lady. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hi, uh, my name is Gaurav and I'm an aid volunteer. I have a uh, question regarding you said that. You wanted to do some case studies, but um, like I'm not a medical student, so I 
forget that term, chloro something that you wanted to do. Chloroquine. Okay. So my question is that you know it's hard for you to do these studies by yourself because you are occupied with other things. While you are doing your work, can you tell other organizations like you know you may have some contacts with AIMS or people who are sitting here in front of the rows who are doctors too probably, and you know is they that can they help you in in any of the studies that you want to do or can you tell them to you know to to help while your work is going on? I'm sure. I'll Certainly, they, they can all uh, they can help. And it's a, it's it's highly uh, a process and, and partnership to reduce the yeah. inequity and research is an important component. And uh, there are so many questions that beg to be answered, uh, which uh, where where uh, you know um, a pa partnership is is uh, going to be really really useful. And 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 in the past, that have you done it before, or any of these studies you have done with any other organizations, or schools or medical schools, if you've done it before or just, or you are thinking about it or you started to do it or haven't done it at all? I'm good. I was discussing with Bhagavad We don't get people easily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, is a great, uh, there, is a, there is a great need for, uh, for association and I think I show that people to work in rural area, uh, we can fight this, uh, we can fight this hopelessness uh, and I think this is a this is a great need. So we are, the answer is we haven't found anyone from medical schools. Uh, uh, we have been try, we're trying to explore whether our own medical I mean our, one of our uh, alumni association our, our own alma mater can allow association. But uh, these are the processes and this frustration. So we we need to work on it more. So I have three ladies here. I have Jonathan, then I will go back. And please, one question per person because we have a study. So who are you? I'm the number one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Yogesh. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm the first lady. My name is Punita Arya. Um, I work at Children's Hospital Boston. And I have one question for you. You come up with such wonderful low cost technologies. Have you had the opportunity, chance, how people approached you to share these technologies with others in the country. I'm sure there are others who need it as much. We, we have a production unit that, that uh, tries to make uh, small volume uh, uh, products, small volume of these products. But I think this has to be owned up. Uh, there is a partnership with those uh, entrepreneurs who can, uh, who can take this as a, as a uh, who can take up uh, production and then marketing uh, is necessary. The caution is that you know that they have to say that the basic principles have to be not compromised. With, that they have to be there for those who are disadvantaged. With uh, uh, they, they, they have to be. You know, those principles have to be uh, have to be followed. In. And also preventing uh, so-called uh, property intellectual rights. You know, that they make it and they don't allow any else to make. That shouldn't be the case. Uh, and uh, one is really looking for such people who would be uh, to either join hand or to take the idea and then they would uh, uh, My name is Asta. I'm studying at the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you mentioned the use of cell phones uh, in your work. I'm aware of certain models operating in Rajasthan and Bihar that use cell phone technology uh, to the extent that there are ideas that you, we, can, we should have health, like community health workers with cell phones and if we can't reach, uh, we can't have doctors to reach them, set up call centers that transfer calls to the cities and then give the diagnosis or treatment back. I was wondering about your thoughts on such trends because it's an increasingly these are increasingly becoming popular and uh, because of dif uh, difficulties uh, in accessing real doctors, there are these like, cell phones to replace them. So I, I, I think this, this is a, a very uh, exciting uh, field of uh, technology. Knowledge is the most important technology and that allows you decision making, that allows, um, that, that cuts down cost. People want to know whether I need an ultrasound examination uh, which my other physician has advised. They want to consult someone who's more informed. I think, and if, if you advise them, no, I don't think you require it. This saves out suddenly a cost of, you know, about a thousand rupees in, in India. 
this is uh, very exciting. Uh, and this may not require someone to actually go to rural areas because you can then be situated somewhere and yet contribute to uh, reducing inequity. And I, I um, um, uh, yeah, this is really a, uh, a worthy uh, objective to and, a, and an activity to pursue. Uh, provide and this is going to provide health care. Hi, I'm Manjuri Joshi. I'm from Baltimore. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting New Gage in Ganyari. It was a very impressive program. Just have one question. The pockets of the government are the biggest. What can be done to raise the awareness in the government that this should be something they should support? I mean, uh, much as we work outside the, the state, we are public. And I, uh, I for one, and the group uh, completely believe that in an unequal society, the state is the, has to be the primary provider of healthcare. It cannot be a privatized, uh, more privatized than what is at the moment uh, system that will provide healthcare to the poor. Now, but but having said that, sometimes you are defending the indefendable, uh, the state. I mean, in terms of what they are providing at the moment. I think it has to be, uh, uh, and as I said, the other uh, risks that are happening is this trivialization of ill health, of poor people's concerns that happens by providing one or two of this type of uh, services. Like the National Rural Health Mission in India uh, is providing, is putting a lot of money, but the, most of the money has gone into up upscaling the infrastructure in terms of, you know, the walls have been painted, there are no new equipment, but Human skills have not been put in. Uh, you know, a doctor who has to examine a person before giving a medicine, you cannot, that has not been done. So most of the clinical process is that you hear a symptom and you write a treatment. No, uh, no examination, no investigation is the, uh, is the thing that is. So I, I think to lobby with the state is necessary, but for that you require, a, 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 the, the voice has to be loud and you need a megaphone to, uh, to, to impress upon the state. Uh, and uh, somehow community processes are, are important, but then some pressures more uh, powerful people uh, would, be, would be necessary. Um, otherwise, there is so much of empathy at the moment um, that, um, that actually there are unique champions to speak for uh, the rural people, I, I would say poor people. This, at the moment, is not happening. Hi, I'm Priya. I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, your thoughts on biomedical devices for diagnostics or testing or any other thing that you see uh, is a requirement in your line of work. Absolutely. There are, there are any number of technologies that are necessary which are, at the moment, not, uh, not uh, which are unfulfilled needs. Uh, uh, for example, requiring an oximeter to pick up oxygenation by a cheap device that is available for village health workers. Why should, uh, and, and similarly, there are, there, are, there are many such things that, are, that, that can harness uh, principles and uh, you know, techniques, of, uh, techniques and uh, technologies uh, for better health care. The, the, the risk is, you know, with technology, that it is not value neutral. You, you, it, the, one, the person who is building the uh, technology uh, can determine whether it is Reducing sites, uh, um, uh, or uh, you know, it's reducing inequity. Or you need to apply that test. Where, and I think there's a huge need for uh, huge scope for using uh, biomedical technology. Good question there. Many answers. Well, it's an excellent presentation. You know, uh, old culture like me had much to learn. Now you taught us quite a bit. What's our role? What's the challenges that we, who you face here, have? Could you divide it for us? Yeah, how can we help you yeah. in what you're doing? That's Thank you for doing. translating it. Well, <laughs> 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 and, and, and you know, asking your opinion is one thing. And what's the role of this and what's the role of that? But how can we help you? Um, as I said, I, I started by uh, by saying that uh, this was this was uh, I was a, this was a ranting of a one-time technician uh, 
with, with fellow travelers, sharing with fellow travelers, what, what should be done? There is, there is, the, the, the situation is, uh, is bad for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for the powerless. So one, one is that whatever we do uh, in our own work, we can, if we can apply this test, whether it's reducing inequity, uh, that's, that's, a, that's the one, uh, my, uh, you know, one re, re, reiteration of, of my hope. But the other is that uh, through us, I mean, because we are trying to provide healthcare in a specific area of uh, work where through force multiplication, we are even using it for some other areas. Helping us may help reducing inequity. And in, a, in as much, um, we do have needs uh, for, uh, which I would classify into two things. One is that we do, uh, we require um, money to support uh, the people who are doing and the activities that we are pursuing uh, within this specific uh, uh, geographical and uh, social domain that we are in. And we sort of outline uh, the budgets for that. For coming, I have made some, some, uh, some, some. Uh, uh, you know, I've written up something on that. But at the same time, uh, our biggest need uh, is to get uh, comrades together. This is a, this is a need. Uh, money can get comrades, but. The, the problem is that uh, those, uh, those associations are, are far more valuable. It's not so we want uh, we want uh, both healthcare providers directly, whether it's physicians or nurses or lab technicians or pharmacy people or scientists or uh, uh, as I was saying, mentioning entrepreneurs who can take up this thing to, uh, to further this, and also as well as you know champions who can do who can. Uh, advocate or you know lobby with evidence that we have been able to uh, the experience that we have uh, sort of uh, you know uh, distilled with the with whoever can you know influence uh, the policies and practices. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is also important, but actual service provision uh, is is the area where we require. Human parts are the most. Uh, and in as much I would say, uh, in terms of pragmatism, it would be good if, for those who are, who can uh, contribute for service provision, a minimum period of one month for clinical, uh, for people who are in direct medical specialties, uh, direct clinical specialties, and about three months for those who are not. Uh, a minimum of three months uh, to be with us. For those who are not directly, you know, clinicians, I, I, a surgeon can come and work in for two weeks. And a, uh, a mental health specialist can come for, you know, uh, even one month. So that be also okay. But uh, but those who want to work in the community to do for I think three months. For, for those uh, uh, community-based processes, three months would be a, uh, I would say, a fair minimum. Of uh, all right, before we uh, proceed to the last few questions, I'd like to make two announcements. One is that uh, we will be having lunch after this, and that will be at the Mezzanine Lounge. And lunch has been generously sponsored by eClinical Works, and you're all invited. The other announcement is that in the last few weeks uh, that we were organizing this event, Dr. Vinay Jain from Dallas has proposed a challenge grant of uh, of fifty thousand dollars that he would match up to fifty thousand dollars that he would match for any amount that is raised uh, during this event and to the this event and we've already been successful in raising ten thousand dollars. So uh, I would uh, request you as a part of Aid Boston uh, to join us for the lunch and support us in any way that you deem fit for this wonderful work that Yogesh has presented and uh, you will also get an opportunity to engage with them more substantially during the lunch. And the lunch will be at the Mezzanine Lounge, and uh, for those of you who don't know the, uh, the location, many age volunteers will be present here, and we'll be happy to support you. Yeah. Last three or four questions. Uh, 
Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Carolina Masek. I'm an MD PhD student, and um, I also work with an organization called University of Allied for Essential Medicines, which um, we advocate for generic drugs, generic, generic medical technologies. And you mentioned the importance of generic uh, drugs in your talk. So my question is, um, can you help us with our advocacy specifically? Um, we go to universities and we say, you know, if you develop medical technologies, um, will you remove intellectual property um, protections from these technologies in developing nations? And we've been successful in doing that at several universities, including Harvard, and MIT is kind of our front line. So um, MIT doesn't do that much direct drug development, but there is some, there's a lot of device technology development. Um, so if a malaria vaccine were to be developed at MIT, um, they would want to patent it in India, and generic companies would not be able to, to make it. So we say to them, um, generic technologies are important, and they say, yes, but um, even if you lower the price by allowing generics to produce things, there is no infrastructure to deliver it, and therefore uh, the intellectual property is not the problem. What response would you have to them? I, I think this is uh, the, the last argument probably doesn't hold water. We, uh, of course, that technology, uh, as I said, if anything is useful, people take it. And um, uh, if it has not been accepted as uh, certain technologies, uh, uh, it's probably there was something wrong in those uh, in the uh, in the in the, uh, in the uh, location specific uh, utilization of the technology, uh, appropriateness of that technology. Of course, uh, structures have to be, you know, you can only use, give blood transfusion in a place where there is at least, uh, you know, uh, a place to admit persons, so a bed to, uh, for someone to lie down and us to look after. Um, having said that, those, uh, uh, I mean, the, both the developments have to happen together. There are several, several technologies that need to be, there are several questions that beg um, drug technology to be developed for. Uh, and the work needs to be done on those. And, and uh, I think you, as you well, uh, you, well uh, you emphasized, uh, they have to be generic. Uh, for if, if in a, in a non or someone else, someone has to pick up the tab for them. And uh, the other is the health system have to develop. They, we, they cannot be, we cannot be in either or situation. Uh, I wonder if that answers your question.
long term goal of this uh, program is this program is not required. The of course uh, four years is a period in which uh, one wants to primarily consolidate what one has been doing in terms of service provision for uh, for the area that we are in. But at the same time, uh, one wants to use the information that one, the learning that one has had in uh, in helping <coughs> uh, the cause of healthcare in other areas, in which through which the major strategy that we are planning uh, to use is uh, is training and uh, to some extent uh, advocacy. Of course, we want we want to develop our uh, program in uh, agriculture. This is a small program, better. And uh, there is another thing that we are looking at uh, engaging with the youth and uh, possibly getting into some vocational training. Uh, but that is if there are some people who want to join hands. Of course, it will depend on many other un uh, unfinished agenda work. But, uh, I mean, those can only be taken on when specific people, specific uh, 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 colleagues can join for taking those forward. Whether it's education, whether it's technology development, whether it's uh, research. Um, it's in that sense the organization Jan Swast to say your people tells about is a like a fellowship. Uh, you can get your ideas in, and uh, as long as they are within the uh, overall understanding that it reduces inequity, uh, you can uh, take on a particular activity and uh, and carry it out. Hi, my name is Amrit. Um, I think one of the key messages of your talk was that you've, you've found all this data that's broken a lot of myths about health problems in rural India. And I think we have enough evidence to see that uh, in order to involve the global community as such to help you address these issues, one of the things is if we can share this information with them in a, in a better way. Is there anything that you're planning on these lines? One reason for coming to uh, I guess I, I, I get that. Meet, but <laughs> I you guess. share this thing, but I think publications are very strong. Uh, and this goes. Uh, this is one of our uh, failings in our organization. Uh, in ten years, we have hardly published um, five articles. Much as we have documented them, but uh, published them uh, in peer review. Then. Do you think there are any ethical issues involved in sharing this kind of data? Absolutely. <coughs> Not at all. Hi, Yogesh. Uh, I'm Milan Joshi. I'm a psychiatrist. I actually went to medical school in the same way Yogesh did. And I'm a psychiatrist and I've been practicing for about 30 years. Uh, given the high incidence of mental illness and the evolving psychopharmacology and others, what we do today, uh, what about mental health? And I'm not, uh, without realizing it in any way, uh, it's quite okay, to, it's all right to say that I'm sure these people are depressed and sad when they're ill or whatever, but besides all that, uh, what about depression, what about anxiety, what about psychosis, what about substance abuse, uh, <coughs> and, uh, what about the mental health of these people? And outside of what you're doing for them, which is by itself a huge mental health process, uh, but what role does medications and uh, even the generic medications for antipsychotics, for antidepressants, for anti-anxiety uh, that are very easily available and relatively cheap? What role does that play? We all have a uh, mental health problems. Expectedly, are major are, are a major health problem. Major uh, major uh, major psychiatric disorders like psychosis and uh, major depressions are, are common. We uh, try to manage them to the extent possible that we, uh, to the skill, to the level, uh, extent uh, we have skills for, and using uh, published literature and even you know corresponding with uh, colleagues uh, who online or who through telephone uh, inform us about our decisions when we share uh, you know clinical situations. And I think there is there is a huge huge need which is unmet for mental health uh, care. Uh, uh, in, in, in the program that we are in, and uh, <coughs> really look forward to you know uh, ways to uh, address this, and even developing uh, solutions that may be used used in 
areas which are not as so, so called fortunate as in a way that we have. We have some, something that, um, there's a book that, um, that has been brought out uh, where there is no psychiatrist uh, by someone called Vikram Patel. And, and also similarly, uh, institutions like uh, NIMHANS in India have tried to develop community psychiatry programs. But I think they need to be far more nuanced than, than they are at the moment. And, uh, uh, really, this is a, a, a almost a vast canvas which is uh, of work, of unmet work, unmet need, which is not being, which, which begs uh, attention. So, ladies and gentlemen, if there are no other questions, please let us thank Yogeshwari again for his wonderful work.